uh, even in a cheap seat, you should be able to see my tie. <laughs> some of the folks may know it's what. <laughs> Mike York, this. Bill York, this. What's wrong with you guys? It's the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's oh. album. I got it right away. Margaret got it right away. <laughs> which was, uh, I'm wearing this in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, uh, we're also celebrating here on the Bloomington uh, campus as well. Um, now, I haven't known Margaret quite 50 years, um, 43 years. Uh, we, we've known each other uh, and worked in the same. We met in junior high. Um, really? And uh, really? <laughs> we were working on the same area of institutional analysis uh, literally uh, ever since. Um, I do owe Margaret one personal debt that I can publicly uh, uh, state, and that was in 1986. And I'll filter this into Margaret. And that was, we were at a conference together in Adelaide, and my wife's birthday was coming up, and I said to Margaret, I'd like to get her an opal. Her birthday is in October, which is uh, the first stone of the October. And she goes, oh, I know just the place. And we go off to this shop, and this guy hands me all these opals, and Margaret's sorting through them, because I don't know what I'm doing. And they're beautiful. And this guy hands me this bag of opals, and it's like a king's ransom. And he said, I said, what do I owe you? And what, how do I, you know, I'm really nervous. He said, oh, just take them back to Canberra with you and send the back ones the back, the ones you don't want. And then we'll figure out what we owe you. And why'd that happen? Because I was with Margaret. <laughs> um, and he trusted Margaret. And so it all worked out. My wife got some opals, and it's the best person. And I wrote a book on trust. And that's <laughs> my point. And that's the segue is that Margaret wrote a whole book on trust. And uh, we're talking about it tomorrow in my class as well, uh, about uh, one of her articles on trust. Um, now for the more serious introduction. Uh, Margaret, as uh, I think all of you know, is the director of the Center for Advanced Study and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. She's also a professor of political science um, and Professor of Political Science Emeritus at uh, University of Washington. Her honors are a lot. Uh, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Political and Social Science, past president of the American Political Science Association, uh, numerous more awards, among which is uh, one that's a little unusual for an academic CD, that along with her husband, Robert Kaplan, they're on the list of the top 100 collectors by Art and Antiques magazine for their collection on Australian Aboriginal art. And I strongly encourage you to, to go to their site, which I did, uh, and they loan their collection out to uh, Seattle Art Museum uh, on a regular basis, I think, parts of the collection. Um, but it's, it's amazing. Um, there's some in the Met right now. Yeah, so it's, it's in the Met. Gallery 918. Kaplan leave the gift to the Met. Wow. So, um, no, it's, if you like your Aboriginal art, which my wife and I do, it's, it's, it's a stunning collection. Um, she's the author, co author of eight books, over 70 articles. Um, she uh, was a dear friend of, of Lynn and Vincent Ostrom for for many, many years. Uh, and a visitor to the Western Workshop over those years. Um, so tonight, uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Margaret Lee for the 2017 Ocean Memorial Lecture. I'm sure when this will be streaming in as best they can. They probably have an easier time than <laughs> <laughs> So please.
first time, often I give something that I know really well and I can just talk it. This one, I am going to have to be reading from time to time just to remember what it's about because it's really brand new work. Um, it's done with two engineers, one of whom is extremely famous, John Seely Brown. He was the uh, research director for Xerox. Uh, I mean, he's the chief scientist for Xerox and then ran Xerox Park um, in its heyday when everybody who then created all the software and hardware we used went through it. And the other co-author is a very young engineer named David Lee, who's an assistant professor of the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I think he too will be very famous one day. He's a very promising young man. So we were invited, we were all at a conference together on digital technology and democracy, um, or how it's affecting politics these days in a variety of ways. And the three of us decided, having listened to each other, that we should uh, put our efforts together. And so this is, we've talked about it a couple of times, we've begun to write it up, so I'm going to be presenting it best I can. So you may be wondering about the title of it, about a white water world. Sorry, I've got to get my notes here. I'm having a lot of technological problems today. No. Um, so before I go to that, though, I actually want to say a few words about Lynn, um, to whom I was incredibly attached. And Mike and Jimmy heard some of these stories the other night over <laughs> wine and beer and apple cider with mango. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I first met, Lynn and I were both in urban politics to begin with. I was, that's what I did uh, my PhD in, and my first, my first book was in urban politics. And so we sort of got to know each other through conferences and things. Um, but we really got to know each other in, nine, so that was in the late, in the 70s. But we really got to know each other in the 80s. And my first sabbatical, I was in Britain, and I was invited by Klaus Oppa, a very distinguished professor of sociology, who was then at Bielefeld. Those of you who know about Lynn and Vincent know that they have a strong Bielefeld connection. And I walked into the room to give my talk, um, and there were five people in the room. Not a big turnout. But the five people, one of them I don't know who it was, and probably that's a very famous person now, I, don't, I have no idea because I can't remember who it was at all. But the other three, in addition to Klaus Alpha, was Vince, Lynn, and Brian Purcell. So I tell my graduate students this story often because don't worry about the size of the audience, worry about who's in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so Lynn and Vincent immediately invited me to come give a workshop. Um, and were very supportive of my, the development of my second book of Rule and Revenue, which is probably my most important book. Um, and Lynn became a really, really dear friend. I was her program chair for the American Political Science Association when she was the president. Um, we were, she was very attached to my Aboriginal art collection. I was very attached to their collection of Native American and Native Canadian work. And we were just um, very close. And then in 2009, I was asked to, to be the chair of the review of the Ostrom workshop, the, the center, the, the center, Ostrom, right? It's Ostrom, Ostrom Center. And um, it was Saturday, I was taking the plane on Sunday, and I'm sitting there having done a lot of the review work and thinking, this is going to be really, really tough. You know, Lynn is this extraordinary figure, Vincent is this extraordinary figure, this workshop, the center has done this amazing work, and it's clear the university has no appreciation of it, and people have tried to make it appreciate how important what the, this work is and the people who are involved in it are. And so I said to my husband I was, as, I, as I went to bed, I'm like, God, I'm just so nervous about this, because what can I say that they haven't heard before? And in the middle of the night, he wakes me up. He's got his earphones on and listening to the radio. He said, Margaret, you don't need to worry. Your problem is solved. My problem is <laughs> asleep. He said, reviewing the workshop. Lynn just won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so I got off the plane and, you know, expected to be 
me, take a lift, well, there was a lifter, but take a cab. Everybody's there to meet me. <laughs> what can we do for Lynn? I said, well, you might paint the windows and the building and start, but I have a whole list of other more important things you can do. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So those are, those are just a couple of my memories. Um, okay, so as I said, this is work that's very much in progress and very much um, about trying to understand the world we're going to be living in, that we're already living in to some extent, and the world as it will evolve, um, and finding a way forward in that world. So it's very aligned uh, with what Eleanor stood for, and so I couldn't resist, in a sense, uh, talking about this paper because it really does have to do with collective action problems and designs and governance arrangements for the future. Um, I, my focus tonight is principally on problems and how you, how you might begin to dissect those problems. And then I'll get into some of the finding of solutions to them. But that part is still really needs to be developed. As I said, I'm working with two engineers, and there's a whole component of this that still has to be designed and has it. So we're working on the design principles now rather than the actual design. Um, and we're really thinking about, as I said, contemporary action and common pool resource problems. So let me start by saying we live in what we're talking about. This comes from John Seeley Brown and his co author, Ann Pendleton Julian. We're living in what they describe as a white water social, socio technical world. So, the way to think about this is in the 19th century, we lived in a world where there were big boats that were hard to turn around. You could turn them, but they just required a lot of work to do that. We moved into the 20th century, and it became a world where you basically had a sailboat. You could be flexible. You could but you were still dependent on a bunch of things, and, and you could learn certain skills that people had learned for centuries and centuries to figure out how to navigate. Okay. When we get into the current world, we're living in what they call a white water rafting world. It's radically contingent, it's fast moving, and it's hyper-connected. And it requires of us a whole bunch of things that we hadn't developed as skills. We need, it, we need to understand context in a way we've never understood it before, because you've got to make decisions very fast. You've got to sort of see where you are really quickly. So learning context is very important. And developing a whole lot of tacit knowledge that you can call on almost without thinking becomes critically important. So that leads to the question, which is really the question we're coping with, is how can communities flourish? in such a world. And by flourish, we mean survive economically, but also develop a decent way of life. Right? So it's not just survival. And not just flourish as individuals, when you hear Lynn's voice in this part, but also as communities with strong networks and social supports. And this requires us, as I said, to use <coughs> skills and, and our minds in ways we haven't done before to generate a couple things. And I'm going to speak about those for a second. The first, which is not really a central part of this paper, but as I was telling Victor, it's a central part of what I've been doing recently, is to develop, oh, this is just a picture of the increasingly fast rapidly. This is not the, let's skip that slide. OK. What we need is a new theory of the political and moral economy. One of the ways in which we know that the world is fraying is that the neoclassical paradigm, which is basically dominated, um, since the Second World War, right after, right after it, um, is really frank. Um, we had Keynesianism with its set of political economies and its implied moral economy, not necessarily explicit. Then we had Friedman and Hayek, who were the key figures in the development of, among others, in the development of the next paradigm. And we really need a new paradigm. And one of the things we're doing at the Center for Advanced Study right now is trying to help generate such a Paradigm. It's some work that I've, I've begun to undertake. But we also need some other things. And the, I'm going to come back to the moral economy a little later. But as I said, I'm not going to really develop it here. But I want to say some ways in which we might start to generate it. The other thing we need is a new theory of behavior. And here Lynn's work becomes extremely important again. 
as Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize yesterday or two days ago for his work on behavior. Danny Kahneman and others had won it earlier. Um, and we're beginning to make some advances in really understanding human behavior. Um, but we need further advances. And we need to know more about beliefs, more about human motivations, more about interactions and institutions. Lynn's work is here more relevant, really, than Taylor's and Kahneman's, who don't really think much about institutions, or interactions much, for that matter. Um, so that's something else that we need to do, and that's something people in this room could be very involved in doing. And that's clearly part of the focus of, of what the workshop is and continues to be about. And that involves, to really advance, and here I'll put in a little thing for the center, really involves real cross-disciplinary work, something else Lynn and Vincent both care about a lot, um, that crosses all kinds of boundaries, breaks down all kinds of silos. Because you're not going to have a decent theory of institutions, behavior, interactions, and beliefs if you just rely on one discipline. We have to learn each other's languages, we have to cross those boundaries. And I want to argue we also have to cross <coughs> sectors that these conversations also require people who aren't in academia, but who bring something to bear that is relevant, depending on the subject that we're talking about. OK, the other thing we need is what um, JSB, John Seeley Brown, and Ann Pendleton Julian call a networked imagination. That comes out of, it's a, we really need to be able to think about things differently. Imagination becomes an important connective tissue in a radically contingent world where you have to read what you're doing really fast, you sort of have to imagine what's around the corner, and be able to do that in a way that's somewhat systematic. Um, and that comes out of your experience and out of your interactions. Um, okay, so let me go to that. Those are the things we need to develop. And some of those we've begun to, some of them we're more advanced on, some of them less so. Now, to, to really solve the kinds of collective action problems and common pool sort of problems and, that we're facing in this new world, um, we can begin with Ostrom's, Lynn Ostrom's model of community government, governance as a start, because uh, it keeps us alert to a number of things that I think are important to be alert to, whether we're in an older world or a newer world. Um, the need to define a common purpose the recognition of nested arrangements of governance from grassroots to central government to even um, international authorities. The sensitivity to local conditions, that is context, but not yet understood the way JSB would have us understand it. And the tax of knowledge that local actors possess. It involves monitoring arrangements, conflict resolution mechanisms, and effective communi communication trust and reciprocity. Those things we still will need in some form or another. They just may take different forms than they took in governing the commons or other of her design analogies. But what we're going to do is assume a very different world than that of the white world, than that world that Ostrom described. This is a white water world. Um, so it is in her version, there's a relatively stable set of connections versus what we're seeing today, rapid and discontinuous change. Hers was place-based versus, versus wide, worldwide and often virtual. The major problems were common pool resource protection and established communities versus creation of new communities that can help members navigate the white water world and create what we're currently, that's the three of us, are currently calling Common Pool Collaborations, CPC. I'm not sure we'll stick with that, but that's what we're <laughs> using at the moment. That's the data that we're in. Uh, we need do, new design principles that adapt Ostrom to this world or come up with a new institutional infrastructure altogether. So that's what we're trying to do. So we're developing models of collective action and solidarity that activate intrinsic motivations to act for the public good and in the interest of others. One of my latest books on the on up here that I did with John Alquist. So if we think about collective action of the past, and this the picture on the cover, which is of Harry Bridges 
organizing the Longshore Workers Union. In the Indiana University article, it said that these were warehouse unions, but they're actually just Longshore uh, unions, <laughs> stock workers. Um, so in the past, um, the, 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 the strategies that worked, worked because there was face-to-face -face contact, there was a water cooler, if it was an office, there was getting together in the hiring hall or working together on the docks and these kinds of, there was a factory floor. There were all kinds of ways in which there was face-to-face -face contact. People lived in neighborhoods where there were local institutions or in communities which were really local. Um, and certain kinds of, the, certain kinds of principles or certain kinds of things that were necessary for activating intrinsic motivations were particularly possible in those kinds of settings. So the kinds of things that John and I find are essential to that are beliefs that acting in the interest of others is the right thing is the right thing to do. Beliefs that there are personal benefits from what from your contribution, what Elizabeth called Wood is called the pleasure of agency. So it's not just a material benefit, it's the it's the joy that comes from participating. There are institutions of governance that provide people with information, a way to challenge that information until they come to credit it or not as true, and a process for determining a collective action. So a whole set of processes that allow people to deliberate together and to challenge each other to argue and to come up with some agreed upon um, belief about what the world was actually like and what they could do to act. Um, it provided a provision of, of choices that allow organizational members to act on their information and beliefs, thus empowering them, at least in their own minds, and perhaps in truth. So the longshore workers would decide not to load a ship that, or unload a ship that came from apartheid South Africa, and earlier not to load a ship that was uh, taking scrap iron to um, Japan at, right after it had taken over Manchuria. That was It also involves leadership in institutions that provide information, protect processes, and ensures that losers in a debate are not punished, um, are more or less likely to engage in the chosen action, and have a well-founded belief that they can win in the future. So leadership is quite important in this story. And all of this happens within a social context in which the individuals um, come to know each other, trust each other, and trusting each other enough to engage in collective processes of both deliberation and action. Um, those things are possible in the world that is not that long gone and still exists for some people, but becomes harder and harder in a radically contingent, hyper-collective <coughs> world where people's jobs aren't necessarily, people's living spaces aren't necessarily connected to those who might have other interests so current strategies developed um, that work with phone, email, et cetera, as means of connection. And those are sort of the present strategies. Um, that, and their aim is really to achieve fairly traditional collective actions. So I've got up here two that I particularly find interesting. They're really the same thing in different countries. There's a whole international network. How many of you are familiar with Move On? Yeah, most of you, not all of you. Get Up is the Australian version. Um, so before I, even, before I talk a little more about them, I just want to tell you that the traditional non, the traditional volunteering organizations, particularly starting with the women's movement in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, the campaign to get for the ERA, was done by a telephone chain that was like the new innovation and then got picked up by lots of organizations. So that was the stimulus for these new kinds of ways of doing things. What um, Move On and Get Up do is use digital technology. They have a whole mechanism for generating petitions. If you go on their website, you'll see loads of petitions with multiple signatures on them. You don't have to go door to door anymore and try to convince somebody they look for the issues that interest them or matter to them. 
um, and, and they do that. Um, and they, they elicit through email and on their website donations. They encourage consumer action. And they create coordinated mobilization. They, they've gotten much more sophisticated since their 1998 origins, um, where they're actually be beginning to build community capacity. They have a whole series of leadership trainings and leadership aid to help people actually mobilize all in person. Um, they get people out for town halls and onto the streets uh, around various collective actions. So very traditional collective action, but very important ways to mobilize much larger numbers of people who don't necessarily know each other and you don't do the door-to-door -door canvassing anymore. Generally crowdfunded, but also some big donors, it seems, of all of these that are there hiding behind us. They succeed in amplifying voices and action, and they provide multiple ways to participate. So they're a real, tra they're a real transformation from the old way of organizing, whether you're talking about political campaigns or whether you're talking about union organizing or whether you're talking about mobilizing for the Vietnam War. <laughs> um, you don't need to rely just on the college campus or just on the neighborhood or just on people who are willing to put a it, it reduces some of the transaction, a lot of the transaction cost for engagement and learning about what the issues are and what you can do, giving you something to do right away. Now they have a very irritating feature, which probably all of you know about and want to know about, is that once you're on their list, you get bombarded. I mean, I, I believe in what they do and I'm off their list because I just couldn't deal with the stream of emails. So I check their website periodically rather than be on their email list because it just got beyond irritating, <laughs> uh, which is one of the facilities of this kind of technology. They're like constantly in your face. OK, so what are we trying to do? We're obviously trying to think about the future and go beyond the present. So we want to create, when you think about move on and get up, and other such things, they're nation-based or local community-based. They're not worldwide-based. They're really focused on particular campaigns that have a more of a place-based focus, which we're going to still do because place matters. But we're thinking about the whole world and not just one country, right? And how to connect people internationally. Um, what we want to do is engender a networked imagination, that term I used earlier, so that people begin to imagine not only and able to act on the world that they're in in new kinds of ways, but recognize that they're interconnected to a whole bunch of people that they'll never know. Which you could do in the union, <coughs> but it's hard. And we're trying to find ways to make that easier, to enable people to act in the interest of others. So that means doing a bunch of things. Reframing the dangerous rapids. So if you, I'm not going to get the white water rapids going <laughs> right now. Um, but we want to reframe those dangerous rapids as an adventure, not as a source of anxiety. And, and make this possible by encouraging the different kinds of knowledge and protection so that people see that it can be fun and you want to try it to try to act this way and try to be in this world and embrace it rather than be afraid of it. So that requires some experience of the water. <laughs> that means getting into the water. That means uh, learning that there are different kinds of rapids, starting slow and moving up. It means to work cooperatively to form networks of practice that go against the, the, that integrate the various groups that are doing a particular kind of thing. So you guys ski, so you want to be part of a whole larger community of skiers. You're part, that's part of your network of practice. So you have your own little community of skiers. You want to be with, you know, find the other skiers and share information about where the good mountains are, where the problems are, where the snow is good, whatever it is that you're looking for. So you want to work cooperatively to form networks of practice as well as identify communities of shared interest, that is, people who actually share your material interests, right? So you're looking for both the skill sets and the 
common affiliation around interests. Interests not just what's fun to do or what your work is. So we shift from content to context. This is a John Sidney Brown statement. The ability to real, read context is super important. Um, we need to read the ripples to understand what's going on and know where, understand what rocks are deep and which rocks are just little pebbles on the top of the water. And we develop tacit knowledge of the environment, the natural, and the, of the environment, both the natural environment and the people environment. So I think this metaphor is really useful. And it has one, one other piece to it. We need to develop, and this gets into some of the design principles, we need to develop guardrails. There needs to be some way to feel that if you get in the water, if you try this out, you won't die, right? That you'll survive it. So you need a series of protections as you're learning how to do it, and even and those protections will change as you get more experience and have more capacity to operate with it. Okay, so our proposed solution is based on advances in computer science, deep learning, and networking, and we're now about to enter the area where I am not, I'm going to be really fuzzy because I don't, I'm learning as I work with these guys. But here's something I do know. There's a lot of hype about technology. This is a wonderful graph, the Gardner hype <laughs> graph. Um, there are various versions of it. This is Gardner's, but others have taken it and used it in various ways. Um, and the point is that a lot of what we think is just fabulous, we get all excited about it, it reaches its peak, and then we discover it's not so great, and it begins to lose power, and it loses market share, and you know, so there's a lot of hype, and we don't want to be caught in the hype, right? So we're aware of that danger as we develop this. So let me show you David Lee's first take at the future of collective action. And this, this may be hard to read. Yeah, we should change that to blue. You can't see it at all. Um, so it, there's this world of people. That first, uh, that where that squeaky red line is, it says media for defining conviction and calling. Where the hat is, where the, the uh, you know, what you get when you get your baccalaureate. Um, channels for sustainable participation. And then the last one where you see some people connected um, is infrastructure for complex crowd coordination. So this is a form of, what, he's gonna, what we're gonna develop is a form of a crowd sourcing model, but to create collective actions that are in the interest of others, that are for the social good. So how do we do this? Let me lay out some of the features, some of the design principles for what we're trying to do. And I'm almost at the end, I promise. Um, 